Hey there, this is Jenny Chen. I'm the founder of 3D Heels. Welcome to the Lattice Podcast, the official podcast for 3D Heels. This is where you will find fun but in depth conversations with technological game changers, creative minds, entrepreneurs, rule breakers, and more. Focusing on how we can use 3D technologies like 3D printing and bioprinting to reinvent healthcare and even life sciences. This podcast will also include AMA or Ask Me Anything sessions, past Instagram live interviews with influencers, and other direct engagements with our tribe. You know what? This first couple of minutes is always very exciting because we never know. If this is gonna work, I'm recording my voice right now, so hopefully the same scenario won't happen uh, like last week. Um, but Bruce, yeah. I'm pretty happy that we finally made this happen. Um, we yeah. talked about yeah, we doing this uh, Instagram ever since the beginning of this year. Um, mm -hmm. So I want to give everybody a little bit introduction to um, to Bruce Roberts and also how I found him on Instagram. I think. One of the reasons I want to do Instagram Live is to bring people behind their works to the front so that people can see and talk and engage with the artist, the designer, the engineer, the company. Um, and I, I found Bruce's work kind of accidentally. Um, last year, I was extremely fascinated with this uh, concept of generative design. Um, the reason why generative design is so attractive is because um, it can create 3D structures that only 3D printing can do um, using machine learning and artificial intelligence in a sense. And they create these structures that are just like out of this world, basically. This stuff that you've never seen, and yet they're organic. They, they look organic. They, they're really beautiful. Actually, if, you, you know, if you're a sci-fi fan like I am, if you watch a lot of TV, a lot of these spaceships structures of the aliens a lot of them i think they use the same design concept but for oh, 3d yeah. printing perspective um generative design i i think has a lot of potential so i've been just looking around to see who's doing it and i came across bruce's instagram account by the word generative basically and i was just looking at these animation or uh art form it, it's just like i don't know what they are but they're beautiful and they're speaking to me in a sense and some even look very much like the the things i'm familiar with i'm a radiologist i'm familiar with organ systems i i know what human bodies look like and what your heart looks like your kidneys look like and i found this one work um that looks like a kidney but it's growing it's, it looks like vasculatures you know in bioprinting vascular creating vasculatures is like the challenge right now um, so that's how I found you, Bruce. Um, but you're located in Arizona, am I correct? Yep, Arizona. So, uh, so Bruce, a little introduction. He, you, you are, I would say you're a very young artist and uh, you're, you're studying engineering, but your side hobby has always been computer art uh, ever since yes. you were a kid. Um, mm -hmm. uh, actually, you know, you can share with us your journey of how uh, your, you know, how you got interested in this field. And now it seems like you have a lot more work. You're, you're a lot more serious producing more work. So I'd like to hear mm -hmm. just that journey, uh, how you become interested. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I don't know what year it was, but I was about 12 years old and the iPod Touch came out, like the iPhone and all that. And it made me so excited because I wanted to make apps for it. Because around the same time, they were um, releasing the software development kit for uh, developers so that just people can just make apps and put it on the app store. And uh, I wanted to try doing that. And um, I did that for a while. But then that um, kind of turned into just doing like graphics and like user interface designing and stuff. And now it's kind of evolved even more into just the visual stuff, like just like, you know, generative art. Yeah, it started with um, just trying to make apps. Yeah, you're one of those people who actually uh, program as a hobby, just like some people read mathematical books as a hobby. Um, a little yeah. uncommon, <laughs> but I'm glad that you exist. And uh, I certainly appreciate the art that you created. And uh, I looked up all the hashtags 
embedded or have almost all the hashtags embedded in your work. Um, but I think, you know, I think for the audience, it will be very beneficial to learn some basic concepts of computer art. Um, yeah. you, you mentioned a lot of things about generative art, um, algorithmic. Did I say that right? Mm -hmm. Algorithmic art, yeah. Yeah. fractal, um, maybe mm -hmm. even boundary conditions, if you want to talk a little bit about those things, because uh, I'm certainly not an expert in these. Okay, yeah, for sure. Um, and, uh, okay, so which thing first? Um, so fractals, those are something I really like because uh, they're, they're kind of hard to express, like, um, without math, I guess. I mean, you can, you can like, draw them, but, uh, I mean, the best way to really, really express them, like, in their full form is with math. And I actually printed out a couple things using my laser jet printer because I thought that would be kind of cool. This is a fractal here. See, it's just a triangle, but if I bring it closer, it's the same shape, and then it's the same shape, and it'll always be the same shape. And trees are like that too, because they're all like you have a branch, and then more branches, and like, and all that. So like, I really am fascinated by fractals and the the mathematical interpretation of them, and how they show up visually in nature. So that's a lot of my inspiration behind it. And what about computer art in general? Mm -hmm. Is well, all computer art I, using fractal or, you know, how, how, no, what that's things in that? That's just one area of it. But, um, computer art, like the way I see it, it's just, um, like computers are usually to do some function, like to build a car or like, you know, uh, edit software or whatever, or edit a movie. But, um, they can also do expressive, expressive things because, you know, humans need to express themselves and like, or I need to express myself, you know? And uh, I do it through the computer. And um, I think that it's important that basically um, computers are also used not just for functional things, but to basically increase the quality of the human experience. Now, is there any mentor or, or books that you read on to learn about this? Um, this is a very new field. Um, I looked around, mm -hmm. it's, it started 1980s around, it seems like the whole field. I mean, to you, it probably oh, yeah. mentioned, but that's relatively still pretty young field. Um, and then coincidentally, mm -hmm. actually 3D printing started around the same time, kind of yeah. started to take off there as well because of the computer, mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah. So is there yeah, any the mentor just... who you follow? Uh, well, yeah, um, I was like, when I was doing it on my own, I was just kind of like, you know, just self-teaching and exploring everything. But then I found some like-minded like people on YouTube. There's um, Daniel Schiffman. He's like the biggest like he created processing, which is the or he, he co-created processing, which is like the uh, the software that people use to you know get into generative art. And um, he makes really fun like funny videos. So like with him like trying to code stuff live, and like it's just totally my style. And um, there's uh, there's another person I, I forget their name, but maybe it'll come to me. But uh, yeah, mostly Daniel Schiffman. He's he's like my biggest inspiration. So in this the, is not this something that's taught in a university in a formal format. Uh, it might be now. Like sometimes when I'm like you know on the internet, I'll see like like courses and stuff that say like computational design or like like really like new media art type stuff. So I think that's really cool. It seems to be uh, showing up in university now. And um. We're going to go into a couple of examples of your work, um, but you know, I'm I'm not an artist myself. Um, however, I appreciate art, and when I see art, it does generate some kind of re emotional feedback to me. And it's kind of strange in a way when I'm looking at basically, you know, the fractal that you're talking about is one mathematical equation or algorithm, and I have mm -hmm. emotional response that this is something beautiful, awesome, mysterious, fascinating, you know, that kind of thing. How how do you translate your expression, your self expression, into your, you know, piece? Mm -hmm. What's your interpretation well, of them? It it is like I'm not really sure if it's like this interaction that people have with math, or it's just with nature, and then uh, nature happens to be like you can describe it with math. I don't know what it is, but like I think both are really cool. You know, whether it's just pure mathematics or you know, something purely visual, but I can tell it's, it's like centered around mathematics and then computers 
help like you know do these massive amounts of computations that would take you know a thousand years by hand and then um, it just spits it out on the screen so like for me it's it's like trying to explore this connection between math which you can kind of like feel but then vision see which you can see so yeah so what is the general process of you creating a piece um it, do they always have a meaning or it was just um i would i think so sometimes i mean sometimes i won't even know what the meaning is like i just want to see something like mathematical and then i'll realize like oh wow that that's super symbolic like later on and then i'll you know try and make something more out of it but usually like there's two approaches like i'll like sometimes i'll have this idea like uh, a pattern or an equation stuck in my head and i i want to visualize it so i'll go try and make make it with lines and points and stuff or the other way is like i'll just see a tree and like i want to know like if i can cre recreate that so it can start either from pure math or from something i'm seeing so since we were talking about the tree um mm -hmm. i got to know you because of your your work um, would you like to show us what, what it is? Uh, I can also show it on my iPad Please. as well, if you have something. Yeah, totally. Um, I printed out a couple more. Let's see here. Actually, Bruce, this is I, one. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's the, final, that's the final version of it. Oh, yeah, that one. That's right, actually. Yeah, and, like, the line has, um, I put a little, like, uh, like, randomness in it. It makes it look more like a tree. And then... I think this is this might be the one you were saying looked like a kidney. I'm not sure. Yeah, kind of looks. The, like yes, an this is a tree. This is supposed to be a tree. Yeah, it's supposed to be. <laughs> but like, yeah, like I can see how you're saying that. Like, if this was just turned into 3D, which is totally possible, it could be printed. You know, that'd be yeah. so cool. The other thing I, I want to show everyone, I'm going to show it on iPad. By the way, um, is the other thing that kind of look like tree but it's not the one that you showed actually that the one that you showed it was the original one here's another one and then you can see the little branch is identical to the rest of the bigger branch so that's i i guess that's what fractal means right like each of these little yeah, elements it means you, similar. Can, you can look closer and closer or zoom out and it always looks the same So I guess this is our analog way of sharing screens. Um, yeah. And then here's, this is a zoom out of that same animation. Is that right? Yep. Is it, yeah, okay. I mean, this looks like a tree. Is this also a tree? Yeah, I, I, yeah I'd say that's a tree. And so how do you decide what algorithm to use to generate this? Um, well, so many things, um, how do I say this? So many things are like based on just trigonometry, like just angles, you know, like the tree branching or, um, the triangle, you know, three angles in the triangle. So like I try to use trigonometry a lot or I, I kind of have to use it a lot. So I kind of think that's kind of a common thing. Lots of trigonometry. But you know what I what I found this morning I found fascinating and also a little bit funny is you actually did a piece focusing on a piece of pizza you ate. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um I'm going to show everyone that. I think this is this is the one. So, I don't yeah, know if you can pizza. I think if you just give it a couple seconds this looks like a pizza pizza with pepperoni on it. Um <laughs> How how did you decide to do this one, and uh, what is the math involved in this? Okay, that one is really cool. Um, that one was a real challenge because, like, there was this challenge this challenge in uh, January where um, people in uh, com computational art had to like try and make certain things, and one of the themes was like make something where you feed in like just like an image or something like that. So I wanted to try and make something that you know did something with images. So I just took a picture of pizza and then fed that into my, my algorithm. And what it does is it looks at all the pixels and it um, extracts the color. And depending on the color, it generates a vector field, which basically they use to describe fluid dynamics. So you're seeing 
a bunch of like fluid flow depending on the color. So if you look at the pepperoni, there's a bunch of spirals. And then yeah. if you look at the cheese, it's like wavy. Or that, that one or the first one. Yeah. The pepperoni is all spirally. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not impossible to do this by hand. If you're an artist, you can, you know, I, I think like in the old day, that's how you, how you do uh, replicating photographs into a paint. But using computers is just so much easier. I, I think yeah. the same, I think the same, uh, I mean, it's not maybe even like so complicated, it's impossible to do this kind of extrapolation. Um, I think similar, I want to just connect the uh, 3D printing audience and, uh, Okay, so I'm making a comment it says, I don't think that pizza slice is edible. I think it it's not. delicious. <laughs> I, I think I want to make a connection that, um, you know, for 3D printing is actually perfect for generative design or generative art or, or the kind of things that computer generated that's so complex that traditional manufacturing process, it would take forever or if not impossible, basically, to create. Um, so I think that's the kind of connection that I think I, I have with your work and, and your, you know, and your thinking behind things. Um, there's another interesting piece that I, uh, I, I started to notice that you, you're maybe doing a little bit more of, I guess, I guess it's the same ex extrapolation kind of work is creating human face or something that can simulate, you know, this is uh, probably, if you, if I take it far away, you probably see that this is some kind of uh, a sculpture face of a of a man and and then you basically created something like this you want to tell us how you are what are you are thinking about it yeah um hi daniela uh anyway that um that's the same inspiration as uh the pizza and uh because it takes an image of just someone's face it's in black and white and then uh the brightness actually changes uh, like how fast the fluid is moving but that one had a bit more uh, inspiration behind it because that's actually a picture of Thales. And um, Thales was one of the ancient philosophers, and he thought that everything was made out of water. Mm. So I thought it would be cool to try and make his face out of, you know, fluid. So it's kind of like a tribute to Thales. I think everything is made of math. Don't you agree? Yeah. <laughs> that's I so yeah, great. I, I definitely do. Um, I think we're in the matrix. <laughs> It's it's kind of interesting that this kind of extrapolation work is almost like reverse engineering humans. Um, mm -hmm. And the the other way around, when you're creating stuff that looks like an organ, sometimes accidentally, it's almost like you're creating humanity in a way. Yeah, it's like, whoa, where did this come from? You know, it's it's, it's weird how it's the stuff, you know, connects. It's like a big pattern. It's awesome. So I see a lot of comments here saying about the pizza. Um, and, uh, and here there's a question, how do you apply creative coding in real life scenarios or any projects in design industry? Okay. One of the ways that, that I know about that this is done is in graphics programming, like for video games, like where they need to make realistic textures and like fire and smoke and all that definitely got to be creative there and like figure out ways to like get the computer to do what you want it to do. And, uh, yeah. And then yeah. also, um, I think it's called parametric design or parametric architecture. Yes. And that's where they literally like use like uh, generative techniques plus physics to like test if a building like will be or like a structure will be strong, like see the weak points on it. So there's so much potential beyond just art. You can bring physics into it. Anything you can describe with numbers, you can bring it into creative coding. Yeah, parametric design, I think it, it was invented by Gaudi. Um, you know, the famous Spanish architect. Um, and then if you have been to Spain, um, a lot of the structures in, uh, it was created by Gaudi. And then he used, he's famously using parametric design a lot. And he created the church, apparently hanging rocks and, and robes upside down to create, to figure out. But, you know, back then he doesn't have computers to simulate. And uh, mm -hmm. he can use, you know, analog ways of doing it. But it was definitely very, math and physics heavy um and he i think he's a pioneer of that field um mm -hmm. i also i guess have you done a little bit of uh, gaming design uh, in the past first um well 
I, I tried to make my own games, but um, I haven't done it like on a on like an industry scale now. Yeah, because yesterday I was just reading around because I gotta get myself up to speed for this, and uh, you, you apparently can create landscape and architecture using um, code code art to create landscape that never existed before or maps that looks just like real map but didn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of a lot of applications. Um, I think the challenges are uh, a lack of perhaps people knowing about this um, and to is standardized education to really inspire people from a very young age. Uh, you sort of um, discovered it yourself, but you know, many of us um, came, to, came in touch with it unknowingly and uh, too late by the time you finish your, uh, your secondary degrees and you realize that there's something else more fun. Um, but I think this also brings back to something that's more uh, related to a question here. And I think this is very relevant. Um, is any tips that you can give in terms of starting doing this kind of art ourselves? Yeah, I saw that comment. Um, look up Daniel Schiffman on YouTube. The, his YouTube channel is called The Coding Train. And he makes excellent videos. Like I've gone, I've gone to him to look at like how to make this or how to make that or, or just watch something random and you'll get new ideas. And he shows like what's going on underneath. And like it's written in... Um, in Java, which is a super easy um, starter programming language. So, and uh, it's all designed just so you can like type two lines and draw a line on the screen or draw a square and whatever and just start playing around with it. So yeah, look up the coding train on YouTube and um, start watching his videos. It's really fun. It does require people to have some kind of foundation coding skills then. Well, it can, this can actually be used to teach programming because it's so visual. So, um, and like in my early programming classes, that's actually what we were doing. We were drawing like, you know, draw a house, draw a triangle. That's how they got us into coding. So I kind of think generative art is like a supernatural, or not supernatural, but a very natural thing to do, yeah. Cool, and any specific language that you think people should start with? Um, Java, since you suggest the uh, YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm just having trouble with that because I, I, I never really liked Java, but I'm realizing that, like, you know, it is it is a pretty good language, you know. Like, I started with, with C, which is, like, a really deep-level programming language, and I like how that showed me, like, how a computer works, you know. But Java will really – that'll show you how to, like, really get stuff done and um, get your ideas out onto the screen. So, yeah. So – where do you want to go from here? We talked a little bit last time uh, in our private conversation. You know, what's your next step? How do you how do you want to where do you want to explore, and what other projects you want to get into? Mm -hmm. Well, first things first, I need to finish my degree, which I should be done with it in like two months, and then then you know I'll feel a little bit more like you know like capable and like qualified to like just approach this stuff full force. And uh, I'm working on a website, and um, I'm just you're just gonna keep exploring math and uh, trying to inspire people to appreciate math just for what it is, and um, just see where it goes from there. You know? Yeah. No, I'm I'm even excited. I may even learn a little bit myself. I learned Python <laughs> over a uh, pandemic, but I don't really have a lot of use for it yet. Um, mm -hmm. Here's some comments. It says. Uh, P P five is also a good start. Yeah. Is P five one is what is P five? Well that one it's pretty much the same. I mean it's it's the processing um library, but it's written on the uh JavaScript language, which is for going in a web browser. And um, you know, that one might actually be a better one to go try and use because then you can actually like get into web design and like make something on the browser. And then there's a website called uh, Open Processing where you can actually go edit and share code and see other people's code all on this website. And it's called openprocessing.org. Cool. I will, uh, so after this interview, I will um, extract all the websites and links. Maybe Brucey can help me to put them together and then to share with everybody yeah. on our website too. Um, yeah. Well, you know, what I want to do is I want to create 3D printable, 3D generative art, which I think is already done. Um, 
I kind of show you a, a artist or a mathematician this morning, George Hart. Um, it was someone who was mentioned to me by a bioprinting founder. And, uh, you know, he, he uses math to create these really fascinating 3D printable uh, structures. Do you think mm -hmm. that's a lot harder to do than what you're doing? Because you're mostly focusing on, you know, two-dimensional art. Um, I mean, things do get a lot harder when, when you go from 2D into 3D because there's, you know, when you add a third dimension, there's just like, that's another infinity there of stuff that you can do in that third dimension. But, you know, once, once you get the math down for that, it's really just the same thing as 2D. Okay, I have a proposal. So it's just the math, it's a stepping stone. I have a proposal group first. I'm going to set a goal of creating a three-dimensional kidney. A three-dimensional kidney, like this here? Yes, I want it to be three-dimensional. Okay by learning this, give me like, mm -hmm. I don't know, six months. I, I don't know, six months seems like a long time, but it's actually pretty fast. Mm -hmm. And then we can uh, maybe reconvey and, and then see where I am. But it's just super yeah, fascinating. Like um, because, um, you know, I also mentioned to you, there's another design studio called Nervous System, um, who actually used the same concept of the generative design, generative art to create a lung alveolar and it's actually on a cover. So they then a bioprinting startup, Volumetric, actually, um, they they used this design, this 3D design, actually printed this alveolar, which is a, a little lobule of your lungs. We have millions of them in our lungs to breathe. And this is actually on the cover of Science Magazine two years ago. So it's definitely... Um, something people are looking into, especially from the bioprinting and 3D printing side. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the, but I think the, the foundation, the concept of computer generated design, you know, th this kind of fractal design is, is so important. Uh, I mean, we see it, we appreciate it, but we don't know how it came about. I mean, I saw a comment says, we don't even know that this was coded. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so that's why I think this conversation today is fascinating and important. Um, oh, yeah. the, okay, the name of the, uh, the mathematician is George Hart, H-A-R-T. Um, and then here someone is shouting out uh, Alex Gray Art, which I don't know what it is, but I'll look it up. Do you know anything about this individual? Alex, Alex Gray? No, I haven't. <laughs> oh, I guess Alex we, we both have to Google. Googling right now, let's see. Um, he looks familiar but I don't know. Yeah, there are a lot of things to explore. I mean, I looked up algorithmic art, uh, computer art and all these things on Wikipedia basically, and there are just a bunch of names. A lot of architects are actually employing this kind of design concept. There's just a lot of names. I mean, they made history for sure because they're in Wikipedia, but nobody knows them. And uh, so there's a lot of things, um, mm -hmm. a lot of things. Oh, Alex Gray, he draws body parts. Is that Gray's Anatomy? Gray is the same thing. Not sure. We'll we'll have to look it up. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, no, this is the feel for me. It's uh, it's explorative for sure, and and uh, I, I think it makes sense why you know younger artists like you are gravitated towards it because this is a generation of computers. We have this new yep. tool, and it's time to learn a new way of expressing ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. So let's see. Um, okay, anyone else have any final questions? Bruce, do you have any final comments or wishes to the audience? Um, Lots of wishes. <laughs> well, yeah, just keep it, keep exploring, um, keep keep appreciating math, and you know, get into uh, get into creative coding if you can. It's really fun. Yeah, I agree. Um, and we will compile the links. Um, and the resources for people, you know, where they can learn this to do this more. And uh, that will also benefit myself because I'm going to learn this too, because I've always wanted to do something expressing myself. And uh, there's nothing better than learning generative art and maybe creating a 3D printed structure using that. Mm -hmm. yeah, Thank you very I'm much. For... How, how do people get in touch with luck. you, Bruce, if they want to get in touch with you? 
Um, go through my – for right now, just go through my Instagram, uh, canvas.51, and uh, just DM me on there, or uh, my email is on there too. You can just email me. And um, I'm super crazy busy with school, but I will get back to you eventually. <laughs> Is there any way people can uh, use your art or buy your art somewhere? Um, no, not at the moment. I mean, I had an Etsy for a while, but I don't really like Etsy. I kind of want to just make my own website and like figure out my own thing. Yes. But at the moment, at the moment, I'm just kind of just posting stuff for fun. Awesome. And I, I, we're gonna do another one of these conversations sometime. Uh, in the future, and I will do some follow-up conversations. So thank you everybody for, for joining us today, and thank you, Bruce, for taking your time with us today. Yeah, absolutely. Later. Have a good day. That's it for this episode. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at 3 Heels, and check out the links in the show notes. See you next time. <laughs>